the Spot Track Podcast, talking sports contracts, the salary cap, and business of sports. Today's edition of the Spot Track Podcast is presented by The Athletic. For sports fans, there's no better place to get breaking news, real time commentary, and powerful stories than The Athletic. Download the app, personalize it with your favorite teams and leagues, and get exclusive ad free content at your fingertips. For all of this and plenty more, visit theathletic.com slash spot track and get 40% off your first year. That's theathletic.com slash spot track. My name is Mike Giannetti. Happy Thursday. I know it's a big time for the NFL. We're pumping out plenty of articles, plenty of tweets, plenty of uh, content in terms of, you know, there's going to be extensions. There's going to be cap casualties, possibly some trades. That's sort of uh, formulaically come together here before that March 16th league year starts. It's a, it's a busy time for that, but I'm going to talk baseball today. I, uh, I, like I said, I've been holding off. I talked a little bit about it last week with when the, we thought the, the offer itself was formalizing and some of those components sounded pretty good. There's a gap, a decent gap, and I understand the players throwing that last offer in their face. And I reacted pretty quickly to it, and I've let, I've let it kind of percolate for 48 hours here, as has both sides of the, uh, of the conversation, by the way. And it does seem like they're back at the, the drawing board here today, Thursday for some new communication, which is optimistic, I think. I mean, we don't want them staying away from each other, that's for sure. So Scott Allen and I take another crack at this thing because now that I've seen the bullet points, and look, we're not seeing everything. You know, the, the excellent beats out there, Jeff Passan, Mark Feins, and those guys, they're, doing, they're, they're putting out what they're being given, either from sources, either from releases. And, you know, there's five or six bullet points, the CBT, the draft lottery, draft compensation for free agents, uh, minimum salaries, blah, blah, blah. Some of the rule changes, some, you know, the universal DH, the, the expanded playoffs, the stuff that we've talked about in the last show and, and you're seeing a lot on Twitter and, and in the pieces this week. It's all good. But to me, they're missing a just gigantic, gigantic change. And I think it is, it is jaded the conversation, right? It is, I think that the conversation Scott and I are about to have when players hear even a little bit of it, they run like hell. When owners hear it, they might listen, but at some point, the being controlled by a CBA or being controlled by math part of it probably scares them too because they've been wide open for 125 years or whatever it's been. They've been able to do whatever they want with you know this air quote CBT threshold sitting up there for whatever for forever. There's been no other conversation about you have to do it this way or there's a limit to this. or And I think that's incorrect. And we have so much proof in these other sports and it doesn't have to be a hard salary cap. It can just be a, a few other set of rules, contractually speaking, that Major League Baseball adopts that really will change the whole mechanism. Not just the superstars, not just the minimum guys, but the whole thing. And, and as I get to with Scott eventually at the end of our segment here, basketball specifically, the NBA, might be the only thing, the only entity where trickle-down economics is truly working. Now, they had to fix the rookie wage scale a little bit and pop that up, but you know that kind of massaging is going to happen with these four to five C- year CBAs. But truly speaking, the NBA went from, let's fix, it, fix our superstar situation, and they did, and then they came back in four years, and they, they figured out a way to trickle that down to the middle class. And it's been no looking back ever since. It's why at some point in time, you think LeBron James is underpaid. And at some point in time, you look at Drew Holiday and say, man, that guy should be making more money. It's why, it's why we say the same things about these players. When at the same time, there's these strict set of rules that we have to follow in the NBA and the NHL and for the most part in the NFL. And baseball's got none of them. There's not a single rule out there for how to, how to structure a contract in Major League Baseball. Not a single rule. You can give Juan Soto $500 million tomorrow. You can give Bryce Harper a, one, a, a minimum $600,000 salary the second he, he finishes his 13-year contract in Philadelphia. There's no ifs, ands, or buts. Doesn't matter how long you've played or how little you've played. Doesn't matter what your age is. It doesn't matter how well you've done, okay? Except for arbitration for you know, two to three years. That's the only true barometer that, that, contractually speaking, Major League Baseball offers is arbitration. After that, it's the wild, wild west. And before that, it's the wild, wild west. That's got to change. 
That's got to change. And that's got to be a major part of this CBA. That's step one. Then we get to step two. Then we get to we get raising the minimum wage and, and starting to work on some of those other little things. But I think Scott and I have a pretty evolved conversation here about how the other sports have changed. The NBA has kind of pioneered this model. And it's not so much about the threshold and the cap and, and, and the tax, but it's about the, the rules. And baseball needs more rules, financially speaking. Not so much on the field, right? We're sick of that. But financially speaking, baseball needs more rules. And that's what Scott and I talk about now. All right, Scott, baseball's officially canceled. Our lives are over. There's no reason to talk about it, except for we're going to talk about it. First question is this. Um, I'm sure you've had a couple of podcasts and television shows and things on your uh, docket since the news 24 hours ago or so. Do you think it's, do you think opening day is in jeopardy still? I mean, we are 30 days away here. And I can tell you right now, before I started, before I pushed record here, I read that the two arbitrators are talking right now in New York City. So it's conceivable, right? That over the next week, logical heads are put together and some sort of four to five year bridge CBA is, is agreed to, and we get right back on to spring training and, and onto there, right? I, I don't think it's necessarily a formal 100% shoe in that opening day is gone right now. Yeah, I don't either. I mean, look at, they turned around in three weeks from the pandemic to get things going. So yeah. I think if, if players are, uh, you know, preparing themselves now, you know, keeping in shape, I, I think they could probably turn it around in three weeks again. Yeah. There's a lot of signings. There, there are, I started there to are. do some reporting right. on this. Um, I was halfway through a trade article when the news broke that they did not agree to the deal. I'm going to do the same with the available free agents and some, uh, some payroll stuff soon. There, there's quite a lot of work to be done in that regard in, in terms of filling out the rosters. But I, I think there's hope that April can still happen. Although, you know, the numbers are far apart. That's why we're here. It's not so much a CBT discussion that we want to have, right? We, we know the offers that were put out there. We know kind of where things should be because you follow the NBA and their soft cap slash luxury tax threshold. I dive more to the NFL, which is the hard cap. I, th I think the reason we're here and we both kind of agreed on it this morning is Major League Baseball just needs to find some sort of middle ground between these two sports, right? It's, uh, you know, I know, I know we don't want to necessarily come on here and say, the players need to start seriously thinking about a salary cap, a hard, firm salary cap. But there are some, some factors in play that you and I have both gone through when tracking the CBT stuff in Major League Baseball that leaves us to believe that, you know, the numbers that even we put out there aren't exactly what should be reported because there's a lot of behind-the-scenes stuff. There's player benefits. There's minor league stuff. There's bonuses. There's concessions and gates and things like that, that all kind of factor into this as additional revenue postseason pay at the end of it. There's a lot of minutia that comes into it that makes 50 million, 70 million with that CBT threshold pretty quick. You know, the Baltimore Orioles, Scott, according to our numbers and many other numbers out there, many reports in, in, in articles and pieces are a $50 million tax spending team. But when the AP released the official numbers for major league baseball, at the end of December, the Baltimore Orioles were at 76 million. And that's not even close. But that not gap even. is more than any one salary they paid in 2021, which means that there was a lot of behind the scenes stuff with Baltimore that got factored in that has nothing to do with how much a player made in 2021. That's the conversation we want to have here, right? And it's not so much we're we're putting a flag in, in the moon that that baseball's got to go to a salary cap. But I think it's your point, and, and I'm, I'll let you expand on it here. Let's take that minutia out of it, right? Let, let's make this about the players. Let's give everybody, you know, from the media to the players, to the agents, to the teams, to the leagues, an actual look at what is being spent on the players in a given year and how that has been increased or decreased. And let's leave it there. Let's leave it there. What is this? What is the salary? Tell me about how the NBA does this, because I think that will give us a better answer to where we, this has to go, in our opinion. Yeah, their luxury tax situation is based off the salaries themselves. You know, any if there's any bonuses that were unlikely to be earned that were likely, those get added in. If they were likely that were unlikely, they take those off. 
And then it's based on the salary and then any, you know, there's some grievances and that kind of stuff behind the scenes that we don't necessarily know, but for the most part, it's the salaries. And th there are some slight reductions in the fact that if a, uh, a player was suspended by the league, there's some reduction percentage wise out of it, but otherwise it's straight up salaries. And, and I agree, major league baseball, when we were diving into some of this stuff, some of the illusion that is there it's not based on salaries and the contention that we keep hearing is players want their salaries increased. They want, it's all about the salaries, but if we're seeing the numbers that are coming out with the CBT and it, it has this fluff in it that 99% of people that follow major league baseball can't account for, or don't understand. Or it comes in at the very last about? second. <laughs> right. Right. What, what are we, what are we talking about? I mean, when, like you said, if it, it, use the Dodgers, for example, they are 262 inflated up to 285, which is reported that that's a lot of unaccounted numbers that we and others yeah. don't know that is being in there. So when we're reflecting these numbers and we're saying, well, the Dodgers are at this for the luxury tax or this, oh, they're over by this much when we're talking about in season that, that it's and. And, and let me be clear here because uh, we both kind of had our piece there and, and I want to make sure that this is said. We're not saying this because it's complicated for us to track. Not at you all. Know, we, nothing's more complicated than the NBA and the NFL. That's never, you know, that's ne they're the Kings. I mean, the NBA and their exception system and the timing of all, it's a nightmare for you and Keith, I know. So we, that, it has nothing to do with our role in this process. I'm, th I'm putting my 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 two feet into an agent's sneakers a player's sneakers who now more than ever maybe is starting to care about this stuff because especially if i'm a pre-arb guy right now and i'm doing well you know when i get to my 10 million per year contract matters you know and this bonus pool matters and 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 this stuff is important and if i'm looking at my current team's cbt or just a payroll right there's like three versions of a payroll we've been we've been dealing with this for 15 years there's like three versions of a payroll there's what's active, there's the 26-man payroll, there's a 40-man payroll, and then there's the CBT payroll. And they're all completely different numbers. So I'm not expecting any average show to, to out there to understand the differences or even care about the differences, but it matters for this stuff. And to me, if, if the CBT is this important, if, if it's this thing that's sitting out there that the owners refuse to get near or to approach or to pay for, then it's got to be more transparent. That's what we're saying. There has yes. got to be 100% transparency. The NBA did this a long time ago and the salaries have gone stupid and, and I don't expect baseball to follow suit in that regard, but I do think, and, and there's one big difference and let's talk about this difference. Basketball doesn't use average salaries. Basketball uses annual salaries. Basketball uses annual cap hits with, to account towards that tax threshold. Yes. And I'm really surprised this hasn't come out. Now, the reason it hasn't come out is because it's complicated. It's a huge switch. It's a huge financial change for baseball to do. But if you want to talk about annual spending, right? And Bryce Harper's at 27 million for the next 11 years or whatever it is around there. They have to sign new contracts to increase their CBT. Do you understand what I'm saying? If yep. Bryce Harper stays at one price for 13 years, bad then the team isn't even awarded the ability to have his his contract increase in their favor right so if the cbt threshold goes up bryce harper's salary would go up steph curry's salary goes up you know eight percent every year because that's how the cba says it has to happen for a player of his elite elite capacity in other words the cba has already structured the contract to follow suit with the rising salary cap and a rising luxury tax threshold all of it is working harmoniously. Baseball's just throwing baloney at a wall. And then the average salary part of it is, is hampering the team's ability to naturally and, and, and automatically increase their payroll. So they're having to force it. And basically, that's where they said, we're done forcing it. We've got Bryce Harper. We, we want 11 pre-arb guys and maybe a couple of $5 million guys, and we're good. And from a competitive gameplay standpoint, some of these teams are successful in that regard. And that's the problem, right? That's why half the league has quit on forcing themselves to increase payroll because a couple of franchises have made this work by nickel and dime in the process. But I'm surprised that the average salary part of this hasn't come up. 
you know, because a, a constantly increasing contract, three, mm-hmm. four million more every year would naturally do this for the team. But the owners wouldn't have to think about it. There would be no math involved, right? Massive right. contracts that increase 5% every year with, with a CBT that's built in to increase 5% every year. All the math would be harmoniously synchronized. This is easy for me. Now, it's a big change for the league and a huge league that is Major League Baseball. But this is something the NBA built in years ago, and we just write it off now. In fact, it's, it's helpful in projecting. It's helpful in understanding how the, how the superstars are going to be treated, contractually speaking. The conversation is, are you a max guy or not? And if you're a max guy, there's a formula for that. And yep. if you're not, then we can get a little bit more creative and, and chaotic with the contract, right? Jalen Brunson, is he a $20 million guy? Is that backloaded? Is that frontloaded? But that's the extent of the conversations. Where with, with Bryce Harper, there were people talking 500 million. There were people talking 50 million a year. There were people talking two years for, for, for 100 million. There were people talking 15 years. Let's just finish this off. It's everywhere. And it's got to it's drive owners and front offices absolutely bananas. But at the same time, it, it affords them the opportunity to do nothing. They don't have to do anything because there's no floor. There's really no cap because they're not using it. And there's no contractual formula in the CBA that is, is at least putting them on a track that is consistent with the rest of the league. Your thoughts on this? And, 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 and am I incorrect in saying that this process is successful for the NBA? Do you think the NBA should be a little bit more chaotic and should be having, you know, should Kevin Durant be in his own stratosphere like Patrick Mahomes is? Um, yes and no. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I say I say no because it has forced the the transactions from a trade standpoint from a uh, if if we know a Durant or a LeBron is going to be rotating every three or four years because of player options that forces the salaries to increase because then you know going to a new team you can still get your max salary but then you can still do five percent increases as opposed to staying with your own team and getting eight so you're it's sort of in built in next man up, but they're, they're gradually increasing salaries every year instead of going to a $50 million a year and, and no one's ever going to come close to it or a 75. If, if it went one person at 75, that's not going to really help the middleman. And right now with the, the changes that happened in the CBA where the exceptions and the rookie scale now grow based off of the, the, uh, the cap increase, right. That's bringing the middleman and the low, uh, and what's know. funny, Scott, is that that appears to be where this baseball discussion is now. But I think what I'm saying is they haven't even fixed the top level stuff yet. No, they where, haven't. Where basketball fixed the, the superstar pay and fixed the structure of superstar pay. Then the next iteration said, all right, now we got to take care of the young guys. Correct. I don't, I think baseball is skipping step one, right? Like they got to change the, the way that they structure these contracts first in terms of the tax threshold. And then we can go back and say, all right, now let's bump that minimum wage into a tiered approach, right? If you're a vet, if you're a 10 year vet making minimum wage, you shouldn't be making 650,000. You should be making 1.2 million. And if you're a, you know, let's put a, a small salary floor. You got to spend 75% of your CBT in terms of cash so that the four to $5 million player continues to make the four to 5 million and they don't get dropped onto a minimum like we're seeing with a lot of these players. So I, I just think they're putting the card before the horse right now in terms of you can raise the minimum wage in this league and you, you can raise the CBT, but you're still relying on a front offices to structure contracts however the hell they want. And that's not going to fix your problem. You got to start from the top down and that's, that's bad optics. You know, I remember when LeBron and those guys and Chris Paul went through that iteration to get the max situation built in and they took some heat for that. But then four, four to five years later, they were, they were the guys sitting at that table saying, now it's time to take care of everybody else in this league. And it was a, it was a very transparent process. They got a lot of credit for it. They still got a lot of credit for it. And the league is God just thriving because of the structure. And yeah, and look, the salaries are still the salaries are still absurd. With you know, right. the, when we talked about James Harden getting a potential extension or whatever it might be, you know, we're talking about Steph Curry, who's going to by the end of his contract is going to have fifty million yeah. plus annually. Um, going to your Bryce Harper situation, 
imagine if he could only have signed a four year or five year deal oh, with great a point. player option or whatever. Great point. And then he has to re up that's going to force those salaries to continually increase. Instead of having a flat 27, at least he's going to have to potentially re-up if he's playing well, going from 27 to maybe 30, and that's going to shift the salaries. I agree that you have to start from the top, but I also, you made a point of the, the floor. I think having a salary floor, you know, the players talk about salaries, and, and maybe it's a non-point from the owner side, but from the player side, I feel like they should be forcing – a cash floor, make Pittsburgh, Cleveland, Baltimore have to spend, even right. if they don't, even and, if it's out of the means of the player's production, it's going to force the team to have to spend. And that's going to force the middleman to yeah. have to get salaries increased. You know, if we refer to the Oklahoma city thunder here, <laughs> they're below we've talked about it. They're not at the cash floor. So what's going to happen is the players on that team are going to get a divvied up uh, revenue from the uh, difference that they're below that cash floor. Yeah, basically the, the league team. says the CBA says, if the, if the owner doesn't go out and pay his team enough in the first place, we'll do it for you. Right. Yeah. <laughs> right. So um, if you know what it, I thought it, about Scott here, when you were talking, when you were talking about that, cause I was thinking, you know, because there's no floor right now, because there's really nothing stopping anybody. I mean, the, the Pittsburgh Pirates could truly put out 26 men next year that cost $600,000. Yes, they could. We, we used to run a fantasy um, contest on, on spot track. Yep. And one of the first things we built in was, was not just a cap, but an, a, a threshold that you could only sign X number of players on a rookie contract. You had to go and get, you know, a veteran quarterback or a veteran a wide receiver to go with a couple of rookies. You couldn't just max out on rookie contracts. Yeah, we built in a floor. We built in a floor yeah. that you had to at least yeah. get. To. Yeah. Because and we didn't want people gaming the system. The fact that the actual professional league does not do this is unbelievable. Now you can say the Pittsburgh can never win with twenty six six dollars $600,000 salaries. You're exactly right. <laughs> They're not going to win. And that's the whole point. So how can you, how can we be sitting here talking about how baseball is, is locked out slash on strike because of a competitive imbalance in the game because of a financial spending problem, but there's been no discussion of a floor since November. Right. How can that be the case? How is that not step one? And if I'm the players and I'm as pissed off as, as it sounds like they are because of the, the final offer that quote unquote best offer. Now this is conversation. Number one, fine. You want to, you want to screw with us? We're talking nothing but floor until it's done. And this is this is this is how we actually start getting things moving. Yeah, and and they're they're so stuck on CBT increases or wanting to be so high on the CBT, right? And and they're they keep bringing up salary, salary, salary. If you're really focused on the salaries and moving forward with salaries, you would make the floor number one on your list. You know, the NBA and the NFL both have floors. Now, the NBA is, or the NFL is different. So does hockey. Than the NBA, where it's a four-year average. But both of them, I believe, are at 90% of their their cap. Now, if the CBT is at 210, 90% of that is 189. When I look at the CBT, there's only like... The league average is 140 last year. 140. There's like... There's like seven teams that would even make 189 based off yeah. of the CBT. That's two thirds to three fourths of the major league baseball teams that aren't, wouldn't even be spending to that 90%. And, and by the way, and by the way, Scott, and we gotta be, we gotta be privy to this. And I'm sure this, this happens at basketball to some degree too. There's massive rev, revenue sharing in this league in major league baseball, yes. right? There's 12 or so teams at the bottom of this league that are small markets that get a ton of money from the Dodgers and the Yankees and the Boston and Boston, et cetera. It's two sets of rules. If you're a revenue payer, your threshold is X. If you're a revenue payee, your threshold is X. You got to hit a certain percentage over a four-year span in terms of cash spent, but two sets of rules for those kind of teams. And that should be no discussion. You know what I mean? The Dodgers should have a different set of rules than the Orioles and the Marlins, and, and, and there's no question about that. That's just good for your league. You cannot force the Marlins to spend $189 million. You know what I mean? You can't do it. They wouldn't be sustainable as a product. So but I just wanted to get that in there because everything else you're saying is correct. Uh, you know, it is, it is the nature of the beast. And if you want to tank, you're still going to have to pay to tank. That's the point. You still have to, it's still going to burn you. 
And if you want to do it, you can do it, but you're still going to spend 150 million to do it. Right. And if the, the, the percentage for the floor doesn't have to be 90% to match these other leagues. I mean, if they want to make it 75% or 50%, whatever, but the fact that so many teams are so low in salary, that should be the red flag that the players are coming up with, not raising the CBT. The CBT, by increasing that, is just going to allow those top teams to pay those superstars a little bit more. It's not really going to help the, the bottom pre-arbs, the, the minimum salaries. If you want those salaries to really increase, make a floor that those teams have to spend to to get to yeah. X amount of dollars then you're really going to start to see the parity. Now, if Major League Baseball and the owners, they don't want that, then why aren't we doing some EPL rules where it's just yeah. there is no tax and just it is carte blanche? And if the Pittsburgh Pirates Do you think that pay, ever comes up? Well, let's say this whole, whole season is lost because it's just so contentious. Do you think that ever comes up? Let's just open this thing up, forget it? Possibly. Right. I think I mean, it's more likely that a salary cap is brought up because, and let's be delicate, but let's talk about it. What we're saying with throw out the minutia, let's make this just about the players, the player money is a cap. And let me ask you your opinion. The soft cap in the NBA, mm -hmm. could that go away tomorrow? Do you think that's run its course? Does anybody actually care slash utilize cap space truly for, for positive? Or is it simply just a way for bad teams to get bad, to get worse, purposely get worse? I've been thinking about this with OKC and the Knicks that couple of years yeah. ago for, for Durant and, and LeBron. It seems like the only time it matters and it hasn't been successful is when a, team, when, is when a person is trying to load up for free agency. But with the implementation of the sign-in trade, that's dead. No superstar players ever get into free agency. Ever, yeah. in my opinion, ever again in the NBA, there's going to be a sign and trade put in place. And when you do so in the NBA, you don't have you don't have to utilize cap space. You can if you have it, but you can acquire a player via rights. You're allowed to go over by getting that player via trade. The, 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 the logistics of the CBA and the NBA have have completely, in my opinion, eradicated cap space. So the fact that there's a soft cap and a hard luxury tax, is that a is that a moot process at this point? as we're trying to figure out what Major League Baseball should be doing? Um, I, I don't necessarily know if it's a moot process because it does force the transactions. It forces the movement. It forces... Are you penalized for being over the cap? Um, no. Okay. You're not penalized for being over the cap outside of... Uh, I mean, if, if, if you use a certain exception, then you're hard capped at a certain amount, meaning you can only spend up until that, which has hurt some teams where they're within a hundred thousand dollars of the, that hard cap because they use their biannual exception or something like that. But otherwise teams that are over the cap, you know, they, they, it's not a penalty, but when they make trades, that's when the salary matching comes into play. There's some sort team, of slap on the wrist. In other words, yeah, if you're a team that has a lot of cap space, then you can have, in a trade, you can absorb any player within that cap space. You could take on someone that's mm -hmm. 20 million straight up and just send back a second round pick or cash if you want. And it to. does help the smaller teams operate. It does. And it because they don't want to be to holding payroll, you know, a ton of payroll. They, they want to be able to shed as much as possible at times, you know, like the Marlins would do in baseball, the Rays would do, and then make one big swing for a superstar if possible. Now, it's not likely. It hasn't been successful in the NBA in a long time, right? just hasn't the small market teams. They have to be creative about how they get their players. And but we're seeing them get even more creative because of sign in trades or extending. We're seeing this a lot uh, within the last two years, extend your player yeah. because then you have their rights and you have them under uh, a, a monetary value between 12 and 20 million. That is tradable in a piece to get higher caliber players. So you're seeing them, sort of circumvent that cap with them doing the extensions, signing trade. You're right. The, the, the free agency with cap space is a complete illusion. Yeah, it's gone now. Because, you know, free, you know, this is going to be a down free agency year. Zach Levine, he might be no. a sign and trade to another team. He may stay with the, the Bulls and, and go with that. 
So, but the cap space portion is definitely illusion, especially when you have placeholders of cap holds, because if you keep them like Oklahoma city, they're cash, they're not meeting the cash floor, but they're considered over the cap because they've retained cap holds on their books to yeah. keep them as over well, the they've, cap. They've picked up other teams trash to do that. That too. Um, okay. So back to baseball. You mentioned something there about how the, the lack of free agency, the lack of the cap, uh, care with the cap, the, 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 the turn to the trade for everything, because it is the way the NBA is operating now, even the, even the bad teams, has forced teams to just extend your players and then deal with it when the time is right. And I think, you know, we had, we had that conversation about Zion Williamson last week. He, he's going to get his extension. And then when the timing is right to trade him, he's going to demand to trade out. And, and Oklahoma City will get, excuse me, New Orleans will get the, the, a decent amount of package for him back. That, that conversation would be excellent for baseball, but there has to be a floor. There has to be a reason for the Miami Marlins to extend their pitching staff. There has to be a reason for the Baltimore Orioles to give Cedric Mullins a contract right now. And if there was, you got to increase your spending by 11% this year. You know, if, if that's what the, the three to four year plan is, you, you got to, you got to get yourself 12% every year to get to 50% over four years or something like that. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. But if they had this structured piece in place that the CBA says, you just got to do a little bit here. Those are the guys that are going to benefit and they're going to benefit with, with second, with, you know, sophomore contracts. They're not $300 million contracts, right? Cause that kid's only 24. He's not Aaron judge heading for 30 years old, where this is my one shot. I got to yeah. get as much as possible right now. Cause I'm going to be dead in, you know, in this league in four years that's such a, it's such a gross way to operate that the whole, that's what I'm talking about. Like the top level contracts, they're all broken too. You can say those guys got paid a ton of money, but they had to go that route. They are forced to get this one massive contract because there's no other opportunity right now in this league. Whereas right. your point with the NBA, Durant and LeBron and these, and, and shit, most of the second tier guys, you know, let me, let me add, let me add on that. about going three to four years, turning it over. Cause there's going to be a team to, that wants to pay them a decent amount of money in four years. And it's not even better than yourself. The league has just set up such a nice foundation for this that everybody's comfortable knowing that they're going to, if they can shoot the ball and they can rebound or whatever has to happen, they're going to be compensated in baseball. It's completely opposite. It's completely opposite. Even if you're a, a, a an above average player, if you're expecting 18 million, 99% of the league is just going to say, maybe, but I'm going to go look at the $600,000 guy first. And if he's 95% as good as you, we're not going to sign you. That's where the league is. That's the problem. You don't, you don't even consider keeping your own because the, the, the disparity is ridiculous. Let me, let me add on to that. Going back to your Juan Soto take, $350 million, declines yeah. it, shooting for five hundred. dollars yeah. If there was something in place similar to the NBA where you can only do a four year, five year deal, yeah. we're not, ha he probably takes that 350 or whatever it might be and then re ups in four or five years. There's, there's no, I'm going to wait, I'm going to wait, I'm going to wait because I want that one contract that's going to be 15 years, $500 million. He would make that $500 million plus okay. by having some incentive of signing your own player, you can go up to this amount or a percent of increase. You know, that's what the NBA does. Well, wait, let's break you that out more, because Scott, because you, what you're touching on is very important. Not only is there a, a limit on the term, but because of the years of experience that Juan Soto has, he'd be limited in that regard too. It's tied to a percentage of the, of the, of the cap, of the threshold. When you're three, four years into the league, coming off that rookie contract, you can only go, what, 25% of the, of the, of, a, of the cap at that point. Yeah. Zero to six starting is salary. Yep. So there's, there's litigations built in right there that Juan Soto would only be able to make X because he's only been in the league for three years. The owners would love that. They would love that. The, the nationals would have no wiggle room. You know what I mean? It wouldn't be, well, you know, Scott Boris needs 500 right now as a 24 year old kid. He wants 500 million right now. Now that's out the door. You'll get your 500, but it's going to be four years, 175 million first. And then in four and three years, we can talk about that five-year extension that'll get you to right. 350 at that point. 
that, that's just a better way for the league. But you, and, and that's can, better because you can expect longevity in your career. You can expect, you know, uh, the opportunity to change, right? Bryce, Bryce Harper now has to force his way out of Philly if he wants to leave. He's got to say, I want to leave versus yeah, exactly. my contract's up next year. I have an option to stay or to go. That stinks. I just think there's so much that the Major League Baseball can take from, from the NBA. And we refuse to even think about it, but because the money's so stupid in the NBA, the rosters are so much smaller, we feel like it's an apples and oranges situation. I think our conversation proves it doesn't have to be. You can borrow from the structure of the NBA, make it work for your system, and I think it would fix a hell of a lot of these problems, Scott. Well, and the fact that you would have a, your Juan Soto situation on 25% of the, of the cap or whatever it might yeah. be, that, again, helps bring up the middleman because you're forcing that value there, and then he can re-up again. You're right. One player's not going from zero to 100. Right, because they're – Doing 14 years for $340 million for one player, it only helps that one player or that one half percent of the players that are even going to get to that point. Yeah. You're missing everyone that's below, and they're so focused on the CBT, and the, oh, but they say we're focused, we want player salaries increased. You know, dealing with the pre r situation and adding in a war, yeah, that's, that's great, but it's only going to help. One percent of the one percent of yeah. the bottom what, 100 of hundred players. players. Yeah. So if you had this structure where it's tiered, you're going to make your money. And it, if they want to be a little bit more aggressive, where it's not like the NBA, 25, 30, 35, maybe it's 25, and then whatever you want, fine. But I think the fact that the players are striving for that one massive contract, ten to fifteen years you know, 400 to 500 million They're being forced to they're being forced to because they either get it now or they're not going to get it at all. Yeah. Yeah. And then it limits what teams are going to offer. The Pittsburgh Pirates right now are not even going to consider Juan Soto. But if you had a tiered process and he goes to free agency right. and they have a chance, that's where players and or teams in the NBA that do have cap space, that means they do have a chance to a certain extent because what I love could, about the max system, Scott, is that and it does get a little mundane. You know, we talked about how Durant should probably be worth double what he's making. And fine, that, that's a great discussion to have. Um, he can make his money through boardroom, <laughs> let's be honest. Um, what I love about it, though, Scott, is those fringe max guys. Because that's where the Pittsburgh Pirates can strike, right? right. Hey, you know what? The Lakers probably don't think Jalen Brunson's a max guy, but the Thunder, but the Thunder do. The Thunder will pay him the max. So now, not only does this guy get a huge contract, maybe more than he deserves, production speaking, but it allowed the small market team to come in and overpay a little bit and have a chance to get this guy because of the contractual structure. It, but it's, you need to have a salary floor. Because but you have to you, have the floor. You have to have a floor. Otherwise, Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh has no incentive to do anything. Right. right. But if there was a floor, that would force them to come in and say, oh, we're going to pay $5, 10000000 million more to get them because we like your production, and then we can put pieces around them. That floor is key to having a, a tiered system because if there is no floor, the Pittsburgh Pirates are never going to spend. The, the, the Cleveland Guardians are never going to well, spend. And, and just, to, just to rebut what I just said, because I know that somebody who's listening was saying, yeah, but the Dodgers can, can just come in and give Jalen Brunson $500 million because they're the Dodgers. Not if there's a max. Not if there's a stopping point for every team in the league. Because then you have to start assessing. And by the way, the NBA has limits on how many max players you can have at one time, correct? Yes. Yes. So they've gone further steps to they have to compress this process so that you can't essentially build a super team of five max players, similar to like a fantasy contest, right? I mean, it goes back to that in my thinking. But I I think this has to happen. I think this has to happen. This has to happen for a lot of reasons. More structure, not less structure, because the owners have proved that when they have no structure, they just do whatever they want. And and that's what scares me about the, the current discussion, Scott, is that they're not getting this specific, at least publicly. It's just, let's raise the threshold, let's, but let's not even make them forced to spend. How is that not part of the, you know what I mean? Let's just, right. let's throw it up to 240, but they can still spend 50 if they want. Scott, the, 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 the CBT threshold last year was 210. The gap between the Dodgers and, and, the, and the Orioles was 210. The Orioles spent 50. The Dodgers spent 262. Yeah. What are we talking about here? 
the floor is it. It's 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 a number one on this list. It's got to come be. back. I don't Should care be. if we miss three months of baseball. This has to happen. Like I, like I said, they're skipping a step right now. They're skipping a step in this process. They're trying to take care of the majority of players because that is that is a a rallying point. We saw this with with football. Aaron Rodgers started to take the t- took the Twitter and said, "We got to take care of our minimum guys. The rookie wage scale is too much of a value. Not enough guys are getting extended. Blah blah blah." It's right because. You know, that's where a lot of the league is right now. And that's correct with baseball. 1,400 players in 2021 played at least one game last year and were making less than $1 million. 1,400. So this is a huge pool of players that they're trying to get to right now. And I understand that. But to me, that's next. First, fix the structure. Right. Then fix, then fix it from the bottom up. Fix it from the top down first, then the bottom up. Yeah, because if you're if if the players are going back and saying, well, we want the CBP to be 245 up from 210, mm-hmm. yeah, that that's great. But then the contention is the minimum salary is only going up ten ten thousand dollars. Right, you're literally only helping the the Red Sox and the Dodgers with that because right. they're already spending. So now they get to spend more without with less penalty. You know, exactly. So if the players are truly all about the salary, you're right. Cash floor should be number one. It's going to force all those teams in the bottom half yep. to have to get up to a level. There's enough players, you know, even, even if the, and that's going to force that minimum salary to have to go up because you're going to have to spend more. So you're going to get into that mid-level like the NBA has where they have that. They don't have to have a mid-level structure, but it's going to force the spending and salaries will go up. Then the average salary will go up. I mean, that's been a huge talking point over the last month here is the average salary has gone down instead of gone up. Well, because those bottom teams, there's so many players, the pool, 1400 players making $1 million less. If, if that minimum salary is not going to increase, of course they're going to make less yeah. because that 1% at the top is not going to help offset 1400 players at the very minimum no, salary that the it, bonus pool which is why the nba has built in like you said they built the structure and then in this last iteration of the cba they added in the mid levels and the rookie scale and the minimum yeah. are all based off of that cap increase now so it's all tied as one so we know if the cap goes up there's going to be an increase in minimum salaries no matter what even if even if you want to get to a spot where there's a, there's a, there's a maximum contract. There's a percentage of max tied to players with four, five, six, seven, eight years of experience. And then after that, there's no max, right? So you're, you're in the league nine years, go get 500 million, go, go get, go get the world. You know what I mean? If you're still worth it at that point, but the owners would love the suppressed contract between four and eight. Cause it, it, it's, it's essentially an extended arbitration. Right. But instead of one year contracts, let's start signing four year contracts, three year contracts like basketball does that heavily accelerates their, their average salary from their rookie, the rookie wage scale, which it does. You know, Luka Doncic went from, you know, A to A to Y pretty quickly here. Trey Young as well, starting next year. Rightfully so. But they're making less than stuff. They're making less than Kevin Durant. It's, you're not getting guys coming into the league and expecting to go right to the top immediately. And that's the value owners would want, and that's right. That that's a that's a concession to the owners from from our our four to seven or our four to eight years of experience. We're going to have some sort of governor process in place that that allows us or that allows owners to say, okay, the maximum contract you can sign is twenty five percent of the of the tax threshold per year. Great, I'm still getting a huge raise. I'm getting a couple of years guaranteed. And the owners get to, you know, save a few dollars on their elite superstars for a couple of seasons, at which point then you got to go crazy with Scott Boris and try to figure it out. But I, I just think, and I'm, and hopefully these, these conversations are being at, maybe Max Scherzer is bringing this bell in there. You know, maybe he is saying this stuff, but it sounds like, and the, the, the discussion that's hitting Twitter or hitting the articles, right. Hitting Jeff Passan is it's all about the young guys. It's all about getting those guys paid as much as possible right away. And I think that's dangerous water. I think that's really dangerous because you know why else? What if Juan Soto got his 500 million right now on that Nats roster? They literally have 24 guys making $650,000 and Juan Soto making 50 million a year. 
How is and, that going to work for 162 games in the locker and that room? Team, and that team's not even close to ready. Right. They're going to be terrible. And you got one guy who's, who's got 19 Bentleys and a couple of guys eating Subway every day. You know what I'm talking about? I, I do. Like, that dynamic has to be part of this. You can't have that. You can't have that. The, the NBA did have that. When the superstars got, got paid and got their massive escalations, that was a big problem. You had 40, 50% of, of teams making garbage and acting like it. They hated it because there was, it was a superstars league considerably. So that did get fixed in the second iteration. I, I just think all this I, NBA talk is not garbage. No, it's not. And it I, has to be I'm transferred a, to the Major League Baseball process. It really does. And, I, and I'm a math guy. I love the formulaic aspect yeah. of the NBA because I can go to free agency 2024, yeah. know what the estimated cap is, and I could tell you a rough estimate of what a max salary would be or if, if it such was a good an point. Act, it I would can, help I can, in front offices. I, I can tell you what the exact value of right. the first year of the contract could be and then do 8% or 4% or 5%, I mean, and I could do increases or decreases. I know exactly what the salaries could be for said player mm -hmm. two, three, four years out because of the projection of that cap. So it allows teams, front offices, players, agents to yeah. know yeah. what their value is going to, to be. To budget, to project. Yeah, it's a like, great point, Scott. And, you th and that sounds selfish because it's what we do for a living. No, th this is what front offices are trying to do. And in baseball, it's damn near impossible. Right. It is. Because you don't know, you don't know outside of your prospect in AAA, AA, yeah. oh, they might be there in 20, 2024, but because of manipulation of service time or whatever, they're still going to come in at $650,000 no matter what. And in, in fact, Scott, all you can project is that. Right. It is your prospect. And that's probably why we're here today, because that's the only thing these front offices really have a handle on is their minor league system. We know that these three guys are going to be ready in 2024. So we can start to build around that. That's all they truly know. They don't know when Bryce Harper is going to get pissed off in Philly and want out. They, you know what I mean? But if he was on a four-year contract on a bridge contract and he was forced to be on that contract, now half the league can start to be ramping up like, hey, like, like the NBA just did for LeBron, like the NBA just did for, for KD. We know that there's a breaking point coming soon. Well, and the thing maybe I like we can get that, ourselves involved here if we do a couple things budgetarily to get ourselves ready, right? Yes, and I want to add on that with the Bryce Harper situation. Say it was a four-year deal. Mm -hmm. Give the incentive to the team that he's already on ah. a leg up, and and it sort of is backfiring in a bit with the NBA because of extensions and signing <laughs> trades and all that. But if you give the incentive of all right. We're the max is four years that you can sign, but if you sign with your own team, you could go to six years if you wanted to, and your increase could be X amount percent. Yeah. Or if you go to another team, you're stuck at the four years, and then if you want to extend, that's the other nice thing is there's built in formula for extension. If you're if you're below the max, you can extend up to your max and then get yeah. your eight percent. If you're above it, then you could still get an increase. 120%, but it's forcing an increase and the teams don't have to go to the max. They do in certain instances, but there's instances where, you know, Michael Porter Jr. He signed his rookie scale extension. It wasn't a max. It was five for a hundred. So they didn't go I, to the full max, but I think still this that is a them. phase two conversation though. And, th and that's fine. I, I would want to see how just, just compressing and maybe, a, you know, capping that second contract to some degree, I'd want to see how that works. Does it actually lead to more guys sticking around? Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Or, or does it turn into the NBA, which is every, every superstar wants to leave every three years and go somewhere else? So I think, I think every league is going to be different in that regard based on how the players kind of, uh, you know, how their careers kind of go. I, I just think in the NBA, it's so easy to drop it to another roster and play. You know what I mean? Whereas right. I'm not sure in baseball, that's the case, but I, 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 would want to, I would want to just kind of slow play, play that process, put a couple of these governors in and see how the league for, you know, hashes out for five years. Does it fix the minimum problem? Does it fix the upper problem? Or do we have a massive problem now with guys not getting paid in years nine and 10 of their careers? You know, and that you, you, you hit on it. And I, I mentioned this to you off air uh, last week. The CBA that is agreed to cannot be 10 years. No, yeah. it needs to be 
four or five, maybe an, or six with an opt out in the fifth year, whatever it might be, they cannot go sign this and agree to a 10 year deal. And then in 2032, mm-hmm. it, everything is completely different streaming, NFT, whatever, but things that we're not even thinking about that didn't even exist 10 years ago is going to happen in 10 years. So we can't have them agreeing to something and having 10 years. Because if we, if, if we went to this structure and we rewound back to when Albert Pujols signed and went to the, late, the, right. to the Angels or Mike Trout signed his mega deal, imagine if those guys were on four-year or five-year contracts and then they re up. Mike Trout may be at a $45 million salary as opposed to 34 or whatever he might be. Albert Pujols wouldn't have been locked into a 10-year deal and we all knew it was bad because by the end of the career, and that's why the NBA, NHL has over 35, over 39, 38 right. rules put into if a player is that and they are at a salary and then potential retirement. They, these are the nuts and bolts that have to get discussed because by having those, it's going to help next man up. If Mike Trout would have signed $35 million for four years or five years in that first contract. And then he's up. We see his war continues to go up and he is mm-hmm. as valuable as he is. Then he can go sign $45 million. And that's forcing even the upper level players to be able to increase. Right. But then let, again, let, that me floor recap needs with, to be. let me recap with uh, like a multiple choice test to you here. Yeah. I wonder if this is a decent way to kind of recap. What would you rather see immediately? Would you rather see them shelve average salaries as the tax cap, as the tax salary, so that you could, for instance, with Mike Trout, year one could be a million dollars, year five could be thirty million dollars, mm-hmm. and those are the figures that count against the tax cap, not not necessarily his thirty-two million a year. Or would you rather see um, contract maxes? to some degree, whether it's just through those middling years of, of experience or completely after the rookie wage scale from, you know, four years of experience through the rest of your career, there's a maximum percentage you can sign for against the CBT. I'd rather have a max. Okay. I, I think, I think that would, if you go the route where you could have a, a one year here and then a 30 million here, you're starting to get into the NBA or NFL where your cap could be 10 million one year and 39 million the other year, but there's restructures in the NFL. So that allows the cap <laughs> fluidity. Whereas in major league baseball, once you sign that contract, there are no restructures. The NBA as well. The NBA as well, unless you yeah. do a buyout and then you go sign somewhere else for right. a minimum, but there are no restructures. So if you're going to lock into guaranteed contracts, you got to have the shorter maximum salary so that you can re up. You need that constant re up if your CBT is going to continue or if you go to a, 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 a yeah. cap maximum for lack of a better word, you need the continual increases. Otherwise your salaries are going to stay flat. Bryce Harper signed his AAV stays flat for every CBT that increases. So $27 million now, when you go to a CBT of 250, 260 that they're asking for, yeah, it's flat. You want to have the continual increases so that someone who is similar to Bryce Harper in two, three, four years, Mm -hmm. production-wise, has a baseline to say in negotiations, that's what I'm worth. I want to be at that, and at least the max. I will say option C, the floor is a must. That was the next question. Yep, that 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 is a must. Because then then you're going to force... You, you can still have the Pittsburgh Pirates. You can still have the Cleveland Guardians. You can still have Tampa Bay. Yeah. They can still have their value system. They're just going to have to force those player, those teams to have to pay those players to get up to that value. You're, you're, you're allowing those teams to, the league itself, to have more parity. Because, you know, look at the, look at the NFL. They have a cap. They have a floor. The teams are within... $30 million. Yes, they can roll over cap space, and that's a metric that is allowed for them. Yeah. But for the most part, the Cincinnati Bengals, they can go from 
being number one overall two years ago to being in the Super Bowl. It allows that to happen. Major League Baseball, it's extremely rare that you're going to see Pittsburgh Pirates go from dead last in payroll to in the in the World Series yep. and still have a very low – there's not a mechanism for that turnover, the, the salaries to increase, the payments. So the, the it, Major League Baseball needs to figure out, do they want to be like the EPL system where it's – they don't care. It's it's which wild, Scott wild is, West. which Scott, it, it it seems like that's what the players just offered, and it does, which is bad for because without salary. any of the structure that we're talking about here, without any of the structure, increasing the CBT forty million is just going to let the Dodgers cook, right? Which is why They're I have an Manchester issue. City tomorrow, which is why I have an issue with them saying we're all about player salaries, but. When you really dive into the optics of it, they're not focused on player salaries. If they were, they would, they would really be digging their feet into a tiered yep. minimum salary structure like the NBA, like major league, or like the NFL, where zero to 10, you're at least getting increases every year by the time yep. you're in, even if you're a, a, a player that is 10 years of service, you know you're going to make more than the guy that's coming in on a rookie deal. So they either need to figure out, do they want the Wild West where the players at the top are still going to get the 1% of the 1% or -hmm. they need to have a salary floor where it's going to force the bottom to have to spend. And if they are really, really focused on player salaries, they need to really figure out that structure that's at the bottom is going to raise the bottom to wherever it might be in the middle. Otherwise, what, what are we doing? It's a salary floor. It is some sort of percentage cap max. And that's when the Chris Taylors, those, those, you, those valuable players who are underpaid their entire career start to make 18 to 20 to 24 million. You know what I mean? I always make the joke with Tim, Timothy Moskoff and the Lakers, right? The Lakers needed right. to spend in 2016. They Timothy did. Mozgov got 16 million a year, four for 64. Yeah. There, were t- there were four dozen Timothy Mozgovs in the NBA over the past 10 years. Guys who aren't worth 16 to 18 million, but got it because of a floor, got it because, you know, trade, the max trade salary piece. was 40. So 16's a bargain for your third shooting guard or third center, whatever it's going to be, uh, if he's going to get his minutes. But that's how this works. I, I have to spend, I can only spend so much on Juan Soto, right? If I'm the nationals, I have to spend X. I can only spend so much on Soto. So now three or four other guys have to get some money here. We have to figure out how to do this. And like I said, this can be a four year process. doesn't have to be every single year. You got to sign three players to $16 million contracts. It can be, let's give him 12 this year. Let's extend Kybert Ruiz next year. Let's give him an early extension and get him on the books to help this process. I just think right now you can literally sit on your hands and watch baseball for 162 games as a front office and as an owner and get away with it. And that's not, that's not how it should work. You should constantly have to be updating and, and massaging your roster from a financial standpoint. And that's about structure. So I think if one of the ideas we've thrown out today gets, gets brought up in this CBA, it'll be for the good. Just any oh, sort absolutely. of structure, any sort of you must, or you can only, or, you know what I mean? You cannot exceed or and some four that has to that. be built into this language, because if it's not, if it's just, like you said, the wild, wild West, we already know the answer. Regardless of what the CBT looks like, we already know the answer, how this works. If, out. if you, if you raise the CBT to 245, 250, 275, you might as well not have a CBT at all. Correct. Because it's just going to be wild West anyway. Correct. So that's why I have an issue with them being so dug in on raising the CBT where there are, and, and, and that's what the media is, you know, the reporters it bring is. out. Because it's and the they, biggest gap. But, it is. But, and, and, and I was quick to, I was quick to poo-poo the, the owners for their offer, which was 220, 220, 220. I think it was 224 and then 230. It was something around there. It was, it was about 10 million increased over five years. But now I take that offer up on the Players Association and I say, fine, you want to stick like this? You want to kind of flatline for a couple of years to, to maybe make some money back from the pandemic and stuff. That's fine, but there's a flaw. 
but there's a floor. There's a spending threshold now that you have to hit over the first two years and then over the first five years. And then we'll adjust this with the next iteration of the CBA. To me, that's the way I go. Fine, we'll take your offer on the, on the, th- on the threshold, but there's a floor now. Right. And initially, there's going to be some overpayments. We know yeah. that's going to happen. You're going to overpay for players catch in production. Up. But if you build in two year, three year, four year, whatever the structure would be that you have an out instead of saying, you know, most of the time that we see 15, 12 to 15 years uh, is these massive contracts. If you're down in the minimum salaries, it's usually yeah. a one or a two year deal anyways. So if you overpay for a player two years, they're going to be off your book. Or, or out, the alternative is the thunder. They don't sign the players. They acquire players, which is great. Yeah. If, if that's how the Cleveland Guardians have to do this for a couple of years, they have to bring on players from other teams that not, don't necessarily want those contracts or don't need those contracts. Great. M- movement is great, no matter what it looks like for the, for the league. So I, I just think uh, there's no wrong answer to that other than it's really hard to change that much of a financial structure on the fly. It may cost the whole season. It truly, it, it may cost this whole season to change the financial structure that much but I do think it's worth it. That is really how you make the next generation of baseball, financially speaking, safe and sound and fair and with parity and properly balanced. Not now. This offer is not, this offer is a, is a bottom and a top with no middle. That's what this offer is. Right. And like we said, if, if you have that structure and some mechanism of max salaries or whatever, yeah, then we're talking about it. We're yeah. talking about the NBA all the time of, oh, yeah, I mean, Keith's been doing articles yeah. for us for all these players of what they can make options, based off four of to five formula. options. Because all these the options. CBA we know those options, right? So if we know, hypothetically, if Bryce Harper was a free agent because he was at, at the end of a four year deal, we know the math. We know, and the front office knows the math. So, but the fact that we know the math and the, and the fans know the math. Yeah. Then the fans get invested right now. Yeah. They are not invested because they don't even know what a player is worth. But if you have the structure in place, then also, the talking points this come way. up think, all the think time. Think about it this way. Like, you know, whenever there's a lockout or a strike or things like that, you know, there's, there's a certain set of fans, God bless them. That just want to say, you're making 20 million a year. Stop wine and play ball. Right. Yep. What are we hearing in the NBA? LeBron James should be making 80 million a year. Kevin Durant could be making hundred million a year. Steph Curry's underpaid at 60 million. A year, you know what I mean? Yes. Which is crazy because their salaries are already stupid. And yet the majority of people look at that because there is, because there is government involved, right? The CBA says, no, this is as much as you can make. You can't make a dollar more because yep. there's those, um, those people out there that say, I, I don't ever want that kind of compression in my life and suppression in my life. They think about it. Well, LeBron's underpaid. Well, that's crazy. <laughs> LeBron's going to make five hundred million dollars ba- as a basketball player, but it's almost it almost reverses the thought process. So the superstars can say, "Well, they're they're putting a max on us," but the the optics of it actually benefit them, and to some degree might help them become more marketable outside of the game. You know what I'm talking about? Not only more marketable, but the fact that they're being talked about every four years. Yeah keeps them in the limelight, yeah. allows them to continue to grow. Like I said with Juan Soto, he, if he did whatever it might be, 12 for $500 million, yeah. he may make more than $500 or $500 million over 12 years if he was re-upping every four years or every five years with increases. I mean, th- that's, that's why we have these options for players. Yeah. James Harden, if he extends, he's going to be making X amount of money we know that, especially so if you switch that, teams, especially, especially if, if you, you bounce around and continue to max out. Yeah. Which right. I'm not, I'm not advocating for in baseball. I love the idea no. of one guy playing, you know, somewhere forever, but you're right. And, and like I said, but, I think, I think we'd, we'd, we'd put in some of these steps, see how the game works for a few years. And then if we have to backtrack or change or, or evolve like the NBA has, we do it. But, uh, but there was you know. no incentive for the Washington nationals to sign Bryce Harper to, yeah. to keep him yes, you could have traded them to get pieces, but we know how that works in major league baseball. You're going to get peanuts on the dollar for what you're going to trade them for. So 
if if that that doesn't have to be a number one, but if there was that mechanism of an incentive to keep your own player that you drafted yeah. and you brought up through your system instead of losing them to another team, again, that's just another thing to talk about. Formulaic is is it helps not only the front office and in, in the league itself, it helps the fan. The general fan can go and see and, what a player is worth. And, from and just a, to bring this back, you know, because we, we we are referencing salary cap. We are referencing cap maxes or, or salary maxes based on contracts and the CBT. Most of the players are going to run like hell from those, those buzzwords. They literally go on Twitter and say, I don't even want to hear that, that phrase or Which I'm is, out. But, yeah, but well, I, I want this conversation and, and hopefully other ones like this to, to, to show them, look, you have got to look at what's, what's happening to Steph Curry. You've got to look at what's happening to, to Jordan Poole and to Andrew Wiggins and, and players who are benefiting because there, is, there literally is a trickle-down in the NBA. Okay? It's the only, it, it might be the only fr- you know, corporation in the history of America where trickle-down economics actually freaking worked, but it's working in the NBA. And, and b- baseball is not strong enough. You know, to to just go out there and be a wild, wild west financial structure. It's not. It is failing in front of our eyes. It needs more structure maybe than any of these other leagues combined. But that 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 NBA model is sitting right there. And I feel like they're just ignoring it or they're afraid of it. And I wonder if you polled the players in Major League Baseball out of that 1,400 minimum, if you said, would you want a salary cap? Yeah. I bet you they wouldn't even care. They probably would want the salary cap because then it would have to force the, 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 the it's the very top 1% of the 1% that doesn't want a salary cap because they're making yeah. 40 million, 30 million, whatever it might be. Whereas the bottom is not. So that's why those upper echelons don't want a salary cap. If I bet you, if you pulled the bottom, they, they would possibly be in favor of a salary cap or, um, can I give you some homework? Sure. Can, can you take the NBA model with the current CBT and put together a quick article that shows what, what, what the thresholds of players would be making? So what would Max Scherzer actually be making from the Mets on his new contract? Oh, interesting. What, what could Juan Soto actually sign with the Nationals right now? And, and sort of the different steps of years of experience. It could, it put together the, the, the work, show the work with actual players um, and maybe use one roster, right? Uh, the pre-arb guys, the, the four to eight guys, the 10 plus guys, what would it look like? Because I think if we saw it, myself included, if we actually saw how it looked, the NBA model in baseball, I don't think many players would be taking a discount at all, right? It, it, it would be shorter terms. So maybe that's a little scarier, afraid to bet on yourself kind of stuff. And sure, certainly Scott Boris is going to throw a fit. But I, I don't think it's going to look a lot different, you know, for those top guys. I just don't. I think those guys are probably, for the most part, properly compensated. It's just it, there's got to be a little bit of structure to it. And, and the way that their salaries are, are based out on a yearly basis, right? Yeah, Max Scherzer is making 43 every year this, uh, for the next three years. That would mm-hmm. change. But, yeah. you know, I, I think we could, if we see but, the model. But, but would it change if you implemented a, a 5% or an 8% increase? Would, would it change over no. the course? Yes, in the immediate future, yeah. potentially. But in the long run, it, it has the potential to have them make more money. I mean, I, I, I would love to ask the guys that, say, oh, absolutely no salary cap. I want to know specifics. Why do you not want a salary cap? Look at the two biggest sports leagues in, in the United States and in the world. They both have salary caps. The NFL is king in the world right now, and they have a salary cap. And yeah. the players are still getting paid. Yes, it's a fluid situation, and we see the Saints having to you know, release players, but then they get signed. And there's still a quote unquote next man up, even though there is a salary cap. And so I would love to know the specifics of don't just, just don't say no salary cap is not even a, a word that we're going to listen to. So why do you not want a salary cap? No, that's, know that's, the specifics. that's the whole point of this segment, Scott is, is let's not be afraid of it, but, and it doesn't have to be a hard cap. It can be the NBA model. It can be, some of this structure built into it, and maybe it's a cap max. 
So I quickly just did, because obviously there's a 15 man roster in the NBA. There's a 26 man, 28 man roster in ba- baseball. So you wouldn't have to, you wouldn't be able to just transfer those percentages over in terms no. of like a, a, a maximum percentage of the CBT. So let's just say that the, that if you're eight, eight years plus experience, eight plus years experience. Okay. And you qualify for 20% of the CBT. Do you know what that number would be in an average salary? 210? Uh, 42. Four, I was going to say 40 million. Is 1 million less than what Max Scherzer just signed as right, the highest exactly. contract in the history of baseball. Right. This is what I'm saying. This stuff and is like already said, happening, but if there was something in the CBA that says it can't go north of that or you have to sign at this point or you can't go more than five years, just give the owners a reason to say, all right, it's got to be this. It's not, it's not 13 years. We got to take a little bit of a hit when, when they're, you know, in their prime years, 26, 27, 28. God forbid you paid the player then. You know what I mean? And, uh, and there's at least like something holding their hand through this process versus the wild, wild west. It's got good stuff on this, man. Yeah, this was right. Okay, my thanks to The Athletic. Visit theathletic.com slash spot track for 40% off that first year subscription today. For Scott Allen, my name is Mike Genetti. Thanks for listening to this edition of the Spot Trek Podcast.